Hello, Rudy. It's great to have you here for an interview. You're currently sitting in South Africa. It's summer there. How are you enjoying summer? It's great. Weather is absolutely lovely. You know, it's Mediterranean Cape Town, so yeah. it's marvelous. Yeah, Cape Town is, uh, is a great city. And this leads me to my first question, because your fund is named Desert Lion. Yeah. Have you ever thought about naming it like another South African animal, maybe Cape Town Penguin Fund or something like this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, there are obvious names that you can choose which are quite recognizable, like, you know, Table Bay or Table Mountain or Cape Point, something like that. But uh, these names are quite generic. And I love nature and I love traveling around. And Namibia is one of, uh, you know, neighboring country of South Africa. We do a lot of self-drive tours out there. And in the northwestern part of Namibia, there are a few remaining lions wandering the desert um, on the brink of extinction. And it's truly amazing the resilience um, that they are showing. Uh, in how they are surviving in a very difficult environment. So the name kind of struck, um, you know, having had uh, insight into those animals and it kind of resembled something, the tenacity uh, and the persistence operating in very harsh and difficult environments. And honestly, have you even thought about other South African animals to name your fund after? Or are, are there other animals that fascinate you? Uh, there are many other animals that fascinate me. I am uh, an amateur birder, and there are quite a few, you know, birds, uh, including birds of prey. Um, but again, uh, I think that, so two things about names. Uh, the one is, you know, many of those are kind of generic or has been chosen already. So I'm not aware of any other Desert Lion Capital Funds. Um, there are many better lures and uh, peregrines and uh, other birds of prey funds out there. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, what is in a name? We, uh, over time, you kind of, what you do with the, with the fund or the company uh, and the values and the actions that it espouses kind of attributes the quality to the name and not the other way around. So we've played around, you know, <laughs> we haven't chosen Cape Penguin uh, or we haven't thought of that, but we've played around with many different uh, names we have. Damn, we should have met earlier than uh, <laughs> it might have been the penguin. They're so cute. <laughs> I saw them as I was in South Africa 2013 and there's just this colony. And uh, Well, it, it, it might have been appropriate because, you know, we've been huddling along for some time in the South African market. So uh, it could have been quite appropriate. Might be a great idea for the next fund. <laughs> um, before I show the disclaimer, I just want to pose another question. Um, and you can think about it because it's going back in your history. You started your career as a grain trader. What did you learn from that that's useful for you as an investor? Before you answer, let me just drop the disclaimer. Okay. Um, as always, you can find the disclaimer link below. It says, please do your own work. What we're doing here is a qualified talk. Uh, where we're also trying to have fun and talking about penguins uh, and maybe some stocks, but all of this is no recommendation. Please always do your own work. And um, this is no recommendation, do your own work. So thank you for listening to the disclaimer. Let's go back to the question on your past as a grain trader. What did yeah. you learn from that that's important for you as an investor today? Yeah. The question is actually way more relevant than one might think. You know, I um, haphazardly entered the grain trading uh, industry, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, came from a farming background and uh, studied agricultural economics and just stumbled upon the grain trading industry. And that was a period, just South Africa still had um, grain boards, um, so single marketing channels, which meant that 
for the different grains, wheat, maize, etc., the price would have been set in advance ahead of planting season. So farmers went into the planting season knowing exactly what price it was that they would receive, uh, obviously eliminating a lot of uncertainty from a pricing perspective. Now that market deregulated into a, uh, a free market system by the time that I entered, and it was a very nascent market. Uh, we were one of the early players and I inter interacted directly uh, with the farmers. My role was predominantly to procure grain, you know, drive around in the countryside, meet the producers, the, the farmers and uh, contract the grain, then manage the book, manage the price and then sell it to millers again. And the free market system, as you know, Tillman, is prices moving up and down every single day. And this was a major transition for farmers to offer them a price today, you know, say, I just, just use index numbers, 100. And um, tomorrow, the price might be 110. And farmers, you know, would have thought you have done them in, in somehow. Um, because the market moved up or down. And if the market moved down, you know, it's a psychological call option. If, if the market moved down, farmers would have told you that they made the right decision. But if the market moved up, they would blame it on you. So what I've really learned there is about human psychology. That's what I learned. I learned about temperament. I learned about psychological duress, emotional duress. Um, you know, I come from a farming background. So... Um, I've been on both sides of the fence and farmers can be quite gruff and rough with you if they wish, especially if it's your ma their main income that you're dealing with. So we've learned a lot. We are, I have really learned a lot about human psychology uh, and temperament there. Um, the other thing that I learned is uh, it was also my introduction into financial markets in the sense that uh, I was a reg registered trader for futures, derivatives, options, et cetera. Um, and being young and extremely naive, I thought that there was a way of kind of beating the market. And it didn't take me too long to realize that, you know, commodity markets, especially like that with the rudimentary approach that we had, it, it was a zero sum game, it was a fool's game. So uh, that was kind of the precursor to me to start looking uh, for something more in the markets. So much, how much farmers dealing strategy did you copy for your way dealing with companies or what did, what elements did you copy or learn, take away from this? You still have today as an investor. Yeah. I think especially when it comes to elements like conflict resolution um, and respect for the individual, you know, I have learned that uh, people are generally way more intelligent than what you think they are. So don't underestimate the, their intelligence by trying to manipulate uh, or drive a conversation in a direction. Uh, and when you have genuine and true empathy and genuine and true interest in a subject matter that is important to the people that you are talking to, uh, and when you have respect for the individual that you are dealing with, you know that, that kind of creates um, an environment where there's way more transparency and a willingness to be forthcoming. Uh, and the other thing that I've learned there is that, you know, the best relationships to this very day, I have a lot of very good friends in that farming community. The best relationships that I've cultivated were um, cultivated during tough times when we had to resolve conflicts. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, Business isn't always smooth. Uh, I have learned a lot from the operational. I've been inside the operations of that business. I've had managerial roles in that business. And business is not smooth. Um, if you haven't seen the belly of the beast and, and, and the managerial side and you just read you know, the, the company filings, the annual reports, um, it looks like you know, this pristine uh, clinical model that you can invest in, but it's haphazard, it's volatile, stuff happens and there's, there's friction and there's conflict to be resolved. And I've learned that about business to be understanding about that as well and more trying to assess 
how management is dealing with conflict, how management is dealing with challenges. I think that is something that I was able to bring along and have a reference framework um, when I evaluate management as well. It sounds like you already had a very interesting and also challenging career uh, as crane trader and in the crane industry. What made you bet on this, this penguin we described, the South African market that's wanking along uh, through the last mm. years? I think it's since you started investing, not as, as a part-time job, but since you started investing, it's up 6% per annum. Um, it's not that kind of big of a performance. So you, you decided to bet on the career on investing in South Africa. What chance did you see here? Yeah. So... I think I it was think... around 2018 when you launched the fund, but you started investing at 2013. Maybe you can yeah. add this too. Yes, sure. So a few moving parts here. Let's see if we can touch on all of them. Uh, let's start with the last part first. So the, the fund was launched in the Desert Line Capital Fund launched in April 2019. I have been managing outside capital since 2013. And over that period, you are correct that the South African market has only returned 6% per annum. Now, I have to qualify that by saying that the market, and I guess we'll get to that a bit later, you know, so inefficient and there are so many opportunities in the market that uh, we have been able to outperform that multiple times, purely because of the structure and the nature of the market. So I would be the first to say that you know, if you look at the South African equities market as an entity, um, then I wouldn't necessarily say it is such an attractive opportunity to invest in. Um, I am not advocating going out, rushing out and buying South African index trackers to anyone. Um, my background to your first part of the question, you know, what, what got me interested and in why am I playing in this playpen of the South African in equities market is purely because that's where I cut my teeth. Uh, I started, you know, from that first introduction to financial markets of equity, uh, sorry, um, grain prices, um, trading on the derivatives market moving up and down. Uh, I ventured out and I started looking at companies and investing in companies. And I first, I bought my first company in a, or shares in a company in 2004, whilst I was still at Grainco and a grain trader. And that's where it really took off. You know, it was parallel to a process of reading about fundamental investing and it just immediately, the concept just clicked with me, the concept of being able to buy something for less than what it's worth. Uh, and the concept of exponential growth. So it's merely a function of where I've cut my teeth. At that stage, I didn't go and take a top-down view and say, where are the most attractive value, uh, markets in the world to invest in? Uh, I did was right, what was right in front of me. And over that period, you know, um, I made a lot of mistakes initially, but I cut my teeth from 2004 to 2013 for that first nine years, doing my own thing in the market. and. What I realized is the market is so heterogeneous, you know, it's, um, it's so dispersed. There are so many smaller opportunities of which the return profiles are not representative of the market return as general, that it kind of just fell on me that I realized that there is a huge opportunity here, which by definition will be overlooked um, or not identified if you just look at the SA market um, as a singular entity. Are you the only desert lion in this South African capital market? So is, are there many other players that have the same approach like you have, or is the financial industry more conservative, classical, not looking for the way you look at stocks? Yeah, uh, excellent question. So let's let's talk about the structure of the market um, and take a step back. Now it's a relatively small market. We have about 325 listed equities, um, depending on how you define it. And of that, the top 40 um, completely 
uh, overweights the market. So 80%, 80% of the total market capitalization of the total market is vested in those top 40 stocks. And then you have the remainder of about 280 stocks, which constitutes the remaining 20%. And the top 40 is fairly efficient because that is where all the institutional players play. It's highly liquid. Um, there is a lot of information. There's a lot of analysis. And the South African financial market is quite sophisticated. To give you an idea, we have more than 1,000 uh, unit trusts or mutual funds um, that invests uh, in this relatively small market. But when you get to the small and the mid cap side, there are less than 10 uh, mutual funds uh, registered at last check that invests in this space. And even those are highly regulated um, and they are limited by regulatory um, restrictions. So there's a high degree of groupthink um, of an institutional approach and there are very few who are willing to really venture, you know, off the beaten path. Um, career risk is a, is, is, is a very real thing here. Um, it's, it's not as, um, I would say, audacious and entrepreneurial and individualized that you will see in developed markets, especially like the US, for example. And then if you look at uh, you know, the, the, the entry point, I honestly, th there are a few individuals who manage their own family offices or who manage private companies whom I regard highly, who are very good investors in the SA market. But they do that for themselves and they do it unconstrained. When it comes to formal vehicles doing what we do, uh, I think that is what really separates us in that I am not really aware of any other US-based funds that do exactly what we do um, in, in the SA market. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we follow a completely unconstrained mandate within the South African equities market. Uh, and if you look at our portfolio, you will see that it's highly concentrated uh, and it doesn't resemble the index at all. And if you look at, uh, the dispersion of our returns, you know, it's very lowly correlated with um, the, the index. If you think about the South African market, a name comes into mind that might be known global in the investing scene, it's Nespers. How big mm -hmm. is Nespers in the share of the South African market? And also attached to this question, how global is the South African market? Mm. Because if I'm thinking about what you're telling me, it sounds a bit like Germany, where you have some Mittelstand, uh, the DAX is not that easy to invest, but some Mittelstand and small mid caps that are quite interesting to invest in. Yeah. They are often global companies. Yeah. Naspers, and let's include Naspers and use the two terms interchangeably because Naspers owns slightly more than 70% of process. process. Uh, they completely dominate the market. Uh, give or take where you are, about 25% of the total market cap of SA. So again, if you just take the uh, salient uh, financial characteristics of the market, that's hugely distorted by NASPERS. If you look at the price earnings ratio of the market, for example, and, and other elements. Uh, just if one or two thoughts about NASPERS, and then we'll get back to NASPERS, the role in the market, and then the rest of the market. Um, NASPERS is quite interesting. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Tencent. Uh, we know that well enough. But it is quite amazing that NASPERS, as a South African listed company, um, is a victim of its own success in the capital allocation that it has done. And it, on a look-through basis, NASPERS is now trading at about 50, 51% discount um, to its underlying sum of the parts. So you are buying 10 cent arguably at half price. And there are many other moving parts, both within 10 cent and process, which I believe are undervalued. So the discount might actually be even higher. And NASPERS, I believe, is trading so low due to 
um, a few factors. Uh, it could be that people simply just don't like the holding structure. Uh, we have seen um, holding company discounts around the world. But definitely, I do believe it is uh, that it's SA and people are willing to rather buy process, which is more Netherlands-based or uh, Tencent directly. So you're getting a global company at the SA discount. It's an example of that. And another reason for Nuspers' um, um, big discount is all the institutional funds, they have limits as to what they are willing to invest in. And they would all tell you it's imprudent to have 20 or 25% of our portfolio allocated to a single company. Uh, which in itself is kind of strange that you have the largest company on the JSE actually offering one of the most compelling value propositions currently. And that's a dichotomy with what you're working with on, on the SA market. For the rest of the market, um, let's look at valuations. If you strip out NASPERS, the rest of the market, until recently, we have had quite a strong run over the past few weeks. Uh, but until recently, the rest of the market, excluding Nuspers, has been at uh, valuation levels last seen more than 10 years ago, between 10 and 15 years ago. Uh, we are at uh, multi-decade lows, uh, quite interesting. But again, we need to understand that the market is not homogenous. So it is made up of companies that genuinely are old business models or business models that will struggle given the prevailing um, socioeconomic and political environment uh, and uh, in South Africa. And then again, on the other hand, there are companies that are actually growing quite fast and doing much better. So within that, what people tend to call, you know, Excluding Nuspers, you have a few of the international companies like AB InBev, Richemont, uh, and those companies which are blue chip, um, hard currency hedges. Apart from that, the so-called SA Inc. companies is really a wide dispersion uh, of an opportunity set. And the tails are quite fat. The tails are quite thick. And you will find that there are many, there are many landmines um, it's not an easy environment to navigate. But then again, there are many extremely compelling opportunities. And these are also trading at very depressed prices relative to where they would have traded if they were uh, in a different spotlight or in a different environment. So that is what you need to navigate. Uh, it's, although this market's so small, it's extremely under, uh, important to understand that the dispersion of the data points are extremely wide. Uh, and that exactly is where the opportunity lies in the market. Let's try to experiment a bit with the distribution curve you wanted to draw. Let's say someone asks you which industry would you like to, you don't do shorting, but let's try this as experiment. Which industries in South Africa should you short? And which should you go long? Uh, well, look for longs or shorts. Doesn't mean that they automatically are shorts yeah. or longs, but yeah. Okay, I'm 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 willing to take a jab again with the proviso that even within those industries, you will you might find opportunities. The ones that I say short, yeah. and you might find dads in the ones that I say long. But um, I would say that uh, the industries where there are opportunities uh, that I would go long are industries that widen access, number one. So industries, um, uh, I would say in the financial services industry in South Africa, you know, they, they have structural tailwinds, um, education industry, um, the very, very niched um, areas within um, the, the, the construction industry, uh, education, um, niched opportunities within mining, especially given the macro environment that we are going into now. Uh, and basically anything that is tech enabled, where tech is an, an enabler um, to grow and scale further. On the short side, um, just for what is in front of us right now, 
Uh, I am still concerned about uh, just basic industrial manufacturing, um, locally oriented basic industrial manufacturing. I am concerned about certain pockets of retail. The economy is struggling. Um, how big is the unemployment rate at the moment? It's high, depending on how you measure it, but let's say it's 30%. So it's a very high uh, unemployment rate and we also have very high income inequality. Uh, and then uh, I also think, you know, we, we, we've had quite a glut, uh, not a glut, but a very, very healthy, very strong supply of um, physical retail space. And I do think that physical retail space is also something that will be under pressure for some time to come. If someone would ask you for books to read about business in South Africa, what would you recommend? For the viewers, we will add some links yeah. to the books. So, so Tillman, let's let's just say to the viewers that uh, uh, your questions weren't circulated beforehand, you know. But I have listened to some of your uh, podcast, and I I uh, uh, kind of preempted this question. And uh, one of the books that I would recommend is someone who has inspired me quite a lot um, is Yanni Maton. Um, he is the founder of PSG and, uh, you know, it's just phenomenal. Uh, the book is not very eloquent, uh, but it is instructive in its raw honesty and its raw account of how he as a true entrepreneur, but a capital allocator at heart is what he actually is an activist capital allocator have built up a business started late in his life, you know, near fifties. Uh, and built up a business that compounded at about 40% per annum over a 25-year period. Uh, just amazing. And he gives accounts into the various, various businesses that he invested in, etc. cetera. Uh, I think if you go a bit further back, that's more contemporary. If you go a bit further back, um, it's worthwhile reading up on people like Anton Rupert, the founder of the Rembrandt Group. Uh, it's also worthwhile, you know, he, Unfortunately, he has lost most of his wealth now at the end of, uh, you know, his professional career. Well, actually, he was retired already, but towards the end of his life, Chris Tuvisa, a real trailblazer. Um, so, you know, you, you might say, or, 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 and, and again, this is where there's this massive difference between what the average tell us, the average is not inspiring, but... I can highlight a few individuals and success stories that are truly phenomenal um, of what people have achieved. Um, but that book is a, is, is a worthwhile read uh, to get a authentic South African flavor of the opportunities and how one can go about the opportunities. You already mentioned uh, Tani Mouton. <laughs> Sorry, yes. I hope I get the name right. Uh, it's one of the best capital allocators in South Africa. What are other great capital allocators? You know, I think Brian Joffe, um, who uh, headed up Bitvest for many years. He's a great capital allocator. Uh, currently in the contemporary environment, we've had someone, um, Andries van Yerden, who is heading up uh, Afrimat, uh, an aggregate and construction materials company, uh, exceptional capital allocator. Uh, we have seen some, a mining executive that's coming to the fore. He has made mistakes in the past, but I have to say recently, it seems like he's learned from his mistakes and uh, um, the track record has been quite phenomenal over the past almost 10 years, you know, eight years or so, is Neil Froneman of uh, Sabania Stillwater. Um, yeah, um, I prefer not to go into the fund management space. Um, I think it's, it's, it's treacherous to talk about that, um, but those are the operational, and, and, and I apologize, I probably left out quite a few, but uh, those are the ones that, that come to mind now. If you and, have some, and, and, and that has been instructive to me in the past, you know, that, that has influenced me. If you have some to add, you can send me. Uh, 
sure. the names and I will add a box to the transcript so can sure. people can see the addition. If we talk about capital allocation, we also have to talk about capital. In Europe and the US, we currently have enough of it. How <laughs> scarce is uh, capital in South Africa? Like, um, is it different if you, you aren't here in Europe and US, but um, you can say it from your South African perspective, how scarce is capital? Very. And I think that's the reason for the opportunity. Uh, you know, for capital to truly function, it needs a hurdle. Uh, and the expected return on capital is, is uh, quite high in South Africa due to the limited amount of capital. What we have seen until recently, and I have written about this expected return of capital to South Africa, but until recently, until middle towards end of last year, 2020, We've seen over about a period of three years, three and a half years, a constant outflow of liquidity from the markets. And you have witnessed that some companies posting excellent results and regardless, their prices just go down, go from a 10 PE to an 8 PE to a 6 PE. And that was on the back of indiscriminate uh, redemptions and withdrawals and people are by funds and people just exiting the market. You know, sentiment is a fickle thing. Um, in the end, it is, it is true what Ben Graham said about the market that in the short run, it's a voting machine. In the long run, it's a weighing machine. Uh, but, you know, that fulcrum, those pivots need to be oiled uh, and you need liquidity to oil it. Uh, otherwise, it can be stuck in the voting uh, status for a prolonged period of time. And we have seen that in the South African market, a constant withdrawal of liquidity for three, three and a half years. Uh, with that, obviously, it brings opportunities because you see this constant derating, derating, derating uh, to the point where capital is scarce. And now, you know, with capital flowing around in the world with, I don't know, at last check, it's probably 18, how, how much is the negative yielding debt around the world now? Last time I checked was something like 17 or $18 trillion. I don't know what. No but, idea, I don't care. Yeah, but <laughs> you moment. see, that's that's crazy. You have that and you have a South African total market that's about $1 trillion. And you have global exchanges that are at very high multiples and you have very low interest rates. And I get that. I mean, it's a reality with what we are dealing with. And then you're sitting with South Africa, which still has positive real rates ranging from 3 to 6%, depending on how far you go out the curve. Uh, we have inflation that's under control. Um, and we have high expected returns on our, on, on our equities. So it is quite an anomaly that capital is so scarce. Uh, and I think there are understandable reasons for it because people tend, when people look at a South African fund, it's difficult for them to evaluate the South African fund without taking a top-down approach and looking at South Africa. And if you look at South Africa, you look at the headlines and uh, you look at the statistics, uh, the optics are not good. Um, you know, Tillman, we've had, a, before COVID last year, we hosted uh, an investor trip for people globally. And we've had fantastic people from places like Russia, Dubai, UK, US, fr France, all, all, all over the world. And many of them have never been to South Africa or haven't been to SA for a long time. And I specifically asked them to kind of formulate a view of South Africa before they arrived. And at the end of the trip, I asked them to relay what their new impression is of South Africa. And, you know, without a single exception, uh, they were all blown away. They were surprised by the infrastructure, the quality of the businesses, et cetera. So um, it is a difficult sell. Capital is very scarce in SA. That is why the market is so inefficient. Um, so. I have this dichotomy, this contradiction. On the one hand, the reason we can go off the beaten path and find opportunities that outperforms the market, um, you know, with uh, significant margins, 
is because capitalists are scarce. Uh, on the other hand, you have all these opportunities and you cannot really capitalize on them because you do not have enough capital. So it's a tightrope that we are walking. There's less capital available. Does this make the quality of the capital allocation in South African companies better? I did get a question from Twitter from someone. He asked, why do South African companies seek poor international expansion instead of high cash generation and buybacks or mergers? How would you answer to this question? Yeah. No. The thing is, South Africans in general, and this is not just a personal opinion that I'm espousing now, uh, th th there's been quite a wide ranging um, uh, um, market survey that has been done on this. South Africans in general tend to be more pessimistic about the, the country than what the reality dictates. And they could be we, Germans. <laughs> and and <laughs> so you have the same problem there <laughs> yeah somehow or in some and, parts of the country yes yeah so so you would find that when posed with an opportunity to externalize a portion of your capital by investing offshore whether on a retail basis for an individual when he has an option to invest in a locally focused uh vehicle or investing in an internationally focused vehicle, or when companies at a company level as surplus capital to allocate, they tend to pay quite a high level of consideration to externalizing some of that capital and to diversify from what their perceived risk of SA is and based on their perceived negativity towards um, SA. And the reality is that in the bulk of the cases, those who went offshore the investments didn't work out as well. And those who focused internally and focused on the opportunities that were here, regardless the terrible news headlines and what the media says and the very real political uh, and socioeconomic challenges, they were able to still post very, very decent, more than satisfactory returns. So I do think to a large extent, it is a function uh, of human psychology and being overly pessimistic at 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 own, own home level. Another question about going abroad is why are some South African companies delisting from the local index and going to Europe or the US? Um, you mm. could think of Nespers and Prozos. Um, we we uh, that that is a very very good question and. Uh, it's actually related to your prior question about the scarcity of capital. Um, we have many, especially in the smaller and the mid-cap space companies, we've seen roughly between 40, 60 delist, uh, delistings over the past uh, two years or so. And it is a function of you have these smaller and mid-cap companies which are completely overlooked. Uh, they do have compliance um, issues uh, or, or just they do have to comply with all the regulations. So that's an additional compliance um, burden and their stocks aren't rated. So they cannot use the market for what they want to use the market for. They cannot go to the market. I mean, what is the market function? What was the, the initial I I idea? The initial idea was to go to the market, to open it to the public, to get the public to invest in your company, to enable you to grow in a direction. Uh, when you don't have access to that necessary capital. And then also for the market to create a liquid platform where that can then exchange and value can be realized. Now, for many of those companies, that function um, has very much you know, been suboptimal over the past few years. So why stay listed if you have these regulatory burdens and your stock is trading at 20 or 30% what you deem to be intrinsic value? Um, a good question is why more of them haven't done share buybacks. I think two years ago, it would have been a more reasonable or more valid question. Now, they kind of caught up. Uh, I see many more companies doing share buybacks at depressed prices uh, or lower prices. 
We've also seen corporate action ramping up. We've seen a bit a few take privates, um, but it's a function of the market not attributing fair value to the companies. That's the main reason. Maybe let's talk about progress also in the longer term view and go back maybe to 19, to the 1990s and see where South Africa is today. What has changed since then? Um, also in relation to maybe crime, I have this funny anecdote as I was in South Africa in 2013. We were so much warned before that there might be crime that I went to the ATM, and took like yeah. 30 euros in South African rand. Yeah. And lost it on the way back to the hotel because I was so scared about crime. It was just like stupid, but yeah, <laughs> it's this image that is it still true that you have to be take take care of yourself much more compared to other countries, or is it getting better in South Africa? Two parts to that question. I think if uh, yes, it is still true that you have to be more vigilant in South Africa than you have to be in most other countries. Um, crime certainly is front of mind. Uh, and to a large extent, you know, it's not that people are deliberately malicious. It's more a function of people being poor, people being hungry, people being opportunistic, uh, which one can understand. And it's a failing. Uh, crime is, um, without excuse, it's a failing of um, governance um, and of the economic system. That said, um, if you take the, the Hans Rosling view of factfulness and you look at, take a snapshot at where South Africa was socioeconomically in 1990, for example, and where it is today, then on many levels, we are so much better off. Um, stuff like housing, access to water, people living below the poverty line, uh, access to education, all of that is way, way better. And we've seen a genuine improvement uh, on um, the population in aggregate. So, you know, there's a saying which I have internalized, which is that um, South Africa uh, is never um, as good as it should be, but it's definitely never as bad as it could be. Uh, and South Africa has an amazing um, resilience and ability to continue to grow through crisis, from crisis to crisis. Um, and again, it's, it's quite, uh, you know, heterogeneous. There are areas where there are extreme problems, and then there are areas which are first world um, and uh, very, very progressive. So it's, it's, it's an interesting melting pot uh, of risk profiles, private initiative, um, you know, and, 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 and cultures that you find here. Yeah, it was quite interesting. As I was in South Africa, you could drive through the highest income gated community and after two kilometers you will see some informal settlements informal settlements yes uh, mm. it's or you have in pretoria you have this this malls where you think you're in the u.s somewhere in california exactly. also from the climate and then a few kilometers in the inner city of Joburg, you have this high rise that's squatted by people from north africa from northern africa yeah and, you know, notwithstanding the problems, uh, corruption and political problems that they are, um, is this bothering in the background? Are you hearing it no. or not? Okay. I, I hear it a bit, but it's okay, I think. Okay. Uh, you know, not, notwithstanding um, the, the corruption and the political challenges that we face, we are constantly, South Africa on average is constantly busy widening access and addressing these problems. So we see a lot of construction in housing. Uh, we see a renewed drive into energy uh, and into a better service delivery when it comes to that. Uh, we see infrastructure, you know, roads are being built. Yes, I can take you to roads full of potholes, but I can equally take you to two new roads that are being built and it's world-class roads. You know, it's not just a short-term solution. So um, growth is happening. Um, it's just South Africa is extremely, you know, the data points are so diverse. So 
you can, whatever theory you have, if you sit, if you, if you are a journalist, um, you will find confirming evidence for whatever theory you have um, about South Africa. And that is why I say that I can understand why people are skeptical about investing in a fund that invests in South Africa if you do not understand the local nuances that sure there are area pockets of challenges but there are areas of massive 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 opportunities which are completely overlooked and this is just how granular it is you also have a mission of widening access for international intelligence or maybe not so stupid capital to south africa and you had have two seats investors, Scott Miller of Greenhaven Road and Charles Royce, who is an expert in the small and micro cap space. Yeah. Have you have you gotten an impression from them what them made them finally invest in you and in your fund? What was the quality they saw there? I should ask them this themselves, but maybe you yeah. get an idea about <laughs> this. You you should ask them that. Maybe I can relay the story, you know, the way I recall it, huh? uh, how this all happened. And uh, they were, uh, there was an exchange of letters between uh, Scott and I, which led um, to uh, some FaceTime, you know, a call like this. And Chuck is a mentor and a co-investor, um, a seed investor um, of Scott as well. So he was in the meeting and just, It was, it was a, an amazing conversation, truly, which was followed up by another conversation. Now, apparently the story goes that after that second conversation, um, Scott and Chuck turned to each other and they said, we, look the we like the environment, the fact that uh, you know it's inefficient, so you can make off the beaten path investments. We like where it is in the cycle. You know, it's completely depressed. It's icky, no one wants to invest. And they are, you know, very good contrarian investors um, if the facts merit it. And um, we see an opportunity here, but we do not know how to invest in it. There's no formal structure that actually makes it ideal to invest in it. So apparently they turned to each other and they said, why don't we make it happen? And why don't we propose that we set this up and we will be, you know, use our local contacts and we will be the seed investors. And Tillman, you know, they, um, I, I believe, um, are happy with what has happened given the context with which we have operated in so far. And from my side, I cannot be um, grateful enough and I cannot be praise them enough you know I've never had uh, partners that has been so supportive uh, and has played such a level of mentorship and 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 just support um, to the fund uh, oftentimes you know I it 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 can turn out wrong and it can bring a negative energy or it can uh, distract you from what it is that you need to do um, but I really want to take my hat off to them. You know, they um, created an environment and facilitated it in such a way that I can focus singularly in on, on what it is, where I want to focus. Um, so it's just been an absolute great, great, great journey. You started your fund in 2019. And since then, I think, Or you're showing your materials, also your private accounts, and in them you compounded capital at 17% per annum or something around that, compared to the index that's compounded about 6% per annum. But 2017, you had a year where you lost against the index. I think you lost 10%, but the index made 27%. What happened there? Maybe you can yeah. shine some light on that. Yeah, yeah. Um, just pure volatility. It's just if you if you don't index hug, it's going to happen from time to time. What happened in that particular year? You know, since since we've been going, um, and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this. If I'm not, let's just edit it out. But since uh, we started, you know, we're now in our ninth year. 
we have outperformed eight out of the nine years. And that particular year was the one out of the nine years when we under, underperformed. And we underperformed handsomely uh, in that year. And it was due to position sizing where I had a quite a high uh, conviction, high, big position uh, in a certain company. And it, the company was not overly expensive. Uh, we entered the company at about uh, seven PE trailing uh, earnings. The company was fundamentally a good company, but it was at the time where you saw this indiscriminate withdrawal um, from small and mid caps. And this was a company that was highly illiquid. And we've seen the withdrawals. Uh, and, you know, when you have such a high weighting and you see the company halve and it goes down from a 7 PE to a 2 PE, uh, that's going to hurt your performance. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, if, if we, we typically, this is in the nature um, of what I do, is to have very high conviction portfolios, try and know our companies very well. Uh, so have high conviction, high con concentrated portfolios, and the ride is going to be lumpy. Um, that said, uh, over multi-year periods, the returns have played out satisfactorily. So it's going to happen. We're going to have massive uh, dispersions from the benchmark, and certainly we're going to have more, more down years. It's going to happen again, absolutely. In the seven or eight years you're investing in a professional, semi-professional setup, what were the mistakes that you learned most from? So, so, so this is ironic. The, the mistake that was most instructive is a company called Steinoff, which you might know. Mm -hmm. um, but we didn't lose money on it. We actually we made more than 100%. We made double our money on it, uh, yet uh, that was being lucky. You know, we invested in Steinhoff because we thought the price was attractive at that stage. And again, bear in mind, now I'm talking about 2013, 2014. So I've also evolved as an investor. I wouldn't necessarily do what I did then today. And I really liked um, the diversity of the company, uh, the structural tailwinds, the appar apparent structural tailwinds. The one thing is it was a big company. There was a lot of moving parts. It was extremely difficult to do your due, due diligence on that company. So it was, there was a lot to like, but it was tough to do due diligence. And then Chris Tuvisa, who uh, is one of the gents I mentioned earlier, and I had the highest admiration for, and he had this almost you know, impeccable track record of making extremely, extremely intelligent investing decisions in retail, uh, became a massive shareholder in Steinoff. And I, whether consciously or subconsciously, attributed some of the due diligence which I couldn't perform to the fact that he was an investor. So he was a he, he was proxy to, to, to that due diligence. And there was a bit of a halo effect there. And the price did run up and I did exit because I picked up a few things which I wasn't really comfortable with and we've made our money. But if I'm in fair honesty, you know, I didn't see what was coming uh, at that stage. Uh, and if I knew, if I, if, if I really did the deep, deep, deep due diligence, I probably would never have invested in the company in the first place. But I did because I saw this halo effect. I thought that the mere fact that a very reputable investor is investing in this company means that it should be okay. And for me, that was the biggest mistake, even though we didn't lose money on it. It was the biggest mistake and was the most instructive lesson that I learned. Doesn't matter how reputable the investor is, do your own work do the deep delve, um, everyone can make mistakes. Yeah, with the concentrated portfolio, you already mentioned you're investing concentrated, you have to do your own work for every position. And Exactly, absolutely. And I mean, uh, yeah, that was instructive. Uh, and also position sizing, if you do have a concentrated position of 10% or whatever, I mean, Steinhoff went close to zero. So 
not 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 worthwhile having that kinds of drawdowns or taking that type of risk. So it was very instructive lesson. How do you go about position sizing and also the selection that you say, I want to keep it to eight till 12 positions is your sizing. Um, that means 10% in average per position. How yeah. do you construct your portfolio based on the facts you have? And uh, what's your framework for this? Sure. Uh, so we typically would be invested in seven to 15 positions. We are currently invested in eight positions. And what I do is, you know, it's, it's, it's not a very elegant Excel sheet of, you know, very f um, uh, formalized uh, d approach that I follow. But I would try and explain it as follows. There is a huge opportunity set out there. So what we do is our universe is not that big that we cannot keep tabs on most of what most of the moving parts or most of the companies that are in the opportunity set. And to each of those, you know, some of them I just deem uninvestable and I just don't consider them um, in my investable universe. So I um, eliminate them. Uh, and that would include these that are so-called go onto the two hard piles. And then for the rest that you deem are worthy of evaluating for the investable universe, you constantly try to keep tabs and um, that interaction between where the fundamentals are going versus what the price is doing. You know, those are the two main determinants on what you can expect for future returns. And I then construct what I call an opportunity cost curve. So if there is a business which I have a high degree conviction in that is likely to compound for 30%, that would be quite high up on the opportunity cost curve. And if there is a business that I think is a high degree to compound at 5%, that would be lower end of the opportunity cost curve. And I see that um, as the major um, dictating factor in how we construct um, our portfolio because I want the best of the best up at that portfolio um, curve. And then I will also weight according to that. So regarding weighting, uh, the maximum position size that we can take is 20%. Uh, currently, but if it gets there and it runs, uh, we wouldn't necessarily trim unless uh, it's warranted to trim it. So we can let the position run. You don't and have to trim if it's getting to 30. No. Okay. So what we say is we will not buy more beyond 20% is, is what we say. So currently in our portfolio, we have a position as small as 5% and we have a position as large as 25%, a company that has grown into that. Um, and the allocation is according to, uh, we have an expected, I calculate an expected outcome. And then I weigh a level of probability to that, you know, how much conviction do I have in that um, expected outcome? And if those two come together, the more those two align, the higher it goes and the higher the weighting goes. And the less they align or the more uncertain, you know, the smaller the position sizing or not a position sizing at all. And that then also informs how we might reposition or restructure the portfolio. Uh, if suddenly a strong player emerges that warrants a place under the top three or top four, uh, then we will rebalance the portfolio to give that. We constantly want to select from my definition of an opportunity cost curve. We constantly want to select the best of the best from that. And we want to position size it accordingly within a seven to 15 position uh, portfolio. That's interesting. And it's very hard to get the right formula to make position sizing. Well, that's the thing, you know, you can, you can, I've read Kelly formula and I've read so many, um, you know, papers about position sizing. And then in the end you put in the parameters and you realize that it's all subject to, to judgment in any case. So now if, if the Kelly criteria kicks out, but you should uh, put 55% of your portfolio into it. You're not going to do it. <laughs> um, 
And it's because, you know, the inputs, the variables that you put into the Kelly criteria uh, to begin with might have been wrong or overly optimistic, et cetera. So um, it is a bit of a balancing act. There is judgment involved. And in that judgment, you have to be very cognizant of your own potential blind spots and biases and um, the risks that might be involved and not being overconfident. In your talking about sectors, you already mentioned mining and education as partly interesting sectors in South Africa. Maybe we can try to get a general spotlight on these two sectors. What mining companies exist in South Africa and what mining opportunities are there? Mm. Firstly, let me give the disclaimer that I'm not a mining expert uh, and we have some impressive mining experts in SA. Um, that said, I think we are in for a very interesting um, uh, cyclical trend and era for mining in SA that might just um, have many positive uh, knock-on effects. Uh, currently, what you are seeing is uh, iron, iron ore is doing well, you know, are rich in iron ore, especially in the PGM platinum group minerals, uh, metals, uh, sorry, environment, uh, you know, South Africa remains one of the largest contributors of platinum group metals uh, in the world. Um, the top three, uh, Impala, uh, Anglo-American and Sabanya Stillwater uh, completely dominate the market. Very, very good operators. You have this, uh, and, and you have these structural macro tailwinds um, going green. You know, a lot of this is used in uh, auto catalysts. So, uh, and there is some structural deficiency, supply demand deficiencies um, in the short to medium term. So I think that uh, that can run up quite a lot. And then uh, unfortunately the environment has not been as conducive to accelerate what is happening in um, the junior mining industry and the mine exploration um, sectors. But there has been very impressive finds by some of these uh, junior companies. Uh, Orion Minerals being one of them, finding fantastic deposits of uh, base metals and battery metals, um, which now you know is at the point where they have to start commissioning to, to extract um, these reserves. Uh, the, the benefits are, you know, these are still um, a big sector of employment in South Africa. So uh, they create jobs, they provide jobs. The other thing is where um, commodity prices are now. Um, they contribute largely to a trade surplus for South Africa. Um, actually, you know, boosting the South African um, financial situation. And who knows the future? I mean, I cannot predict the future, but it seems like uh, the central banks around the world are hell bent on continuing printing money. And it's very likely if they continue with this uh, unprecedented experiment that uh, you will see asset price inflation, you will see metal inflation. And this is a sector that is uh, eminently well positioned um, for uh, that perfect storm of excessive money printing from so many different perspectives. Uh, we are invested in uh, one Sabanya uh, that we invested in towards uh, uh, second half of last year. It is doing exceptionally well for us. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a sector not without its ch challenges, but it's just the, 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 the quality of how they operate and the quality of the resources are quite impressive. Um, education, we are invested in a company called Stadio uh, and also uh, in a private school called Kuro through PSG. And what we have is this is a prime example where the failings of government, you know, ideally we would have loved seeing government giving um, access to everyone, to good quality um, schooling and good quality colleges and universities. But unfortunately, the delivery of government has been uh, less than ideal. Uh, I'm putting that euphemistically. And this is where private step to, sector can step into the fore and actually give a better offering 
uh, and be lo and behold at a cheaper price than government can do it and still make a very, very good margin. So we have huge pent up demand, uh, very big uh, mismatch, uh, supply demand mismatch, and that is growing every year. And uh, in something like Stadio, we are seeing where uh, they are coming with a new approach to the market, multi-faculty, multi-mode, um, and um, they have multiple programs and they are inclined towards the world of work. So they actually go towards the workplace and ask them when they de deliver the programs, what is it that you want to see in the graduates when they come out, if you want to employ them. So uh, big opportunities in that. And, you know, additional one would be um, homes, um, housing. Uh, where there are opportunities for widening access um, as well and, and structural tailwinds uh, in, the, in the country. How are the demographics in South Africa compared to Europe or the US? The population is still growing strongly, or? The population is, we have 58 million people in South Africa. Population growth is not that strong, um, to be honest. Um, and you have huge uh, income inequality. So the bulk, you know, you have, uh, if you use the wider definition of unemployment, you have about 40% of people who are unemployed. You have a lot of youth, which is good um, for the future. Um, and then you have uh, the, the middle income and the upper middle income class, uh, which is growing actually. Um, and is creating a lot of opportunities uh, within the economy and for private sector. One topic that comes for some investors and to mind uh, when thinking about the African companies are the car tracking companies. You have an investment in car track. There's also mixed telematics. What is interesting about these companies and why are they so strong in South Africa? Well, you know, the founder of, of, of CarTrack, uh, Zach Callisto, apparently had uh, two cars stolen. And uh, his background is he was working uh, in the engineering department in Standard Bank, and he was working on, by that time was when cell phones were just introduced. And GSM technology, global system for mobile uh, communications. And uh, you realize that you can use Uh, cell phone uh, towers, you know, to track objects. So for him, um, being having a statistical and uh, engineering inclination, uh, he went out and he started purely um, with stolen vehicle recovery is what they did. And this is again, one of those unique situations where um, South Africa probably developed a world-class product by necessity because <laughs> vehicle theft is, is such a high um, occurrence, which has then um, you know, uh, grown organically and evolved into this amazing smart mobility SaaS company um, that is growing globally and organically currently and has 1.3 million uh, um, subscribers. Uh, they're processing 40 billion data points uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, 98% recurring revenue, you know, just an amazing, amazing, amazing business model uh, with such a compelling uh, value proposition for customers. Um, the return on investment, you know, the payback is, is quick, you know, one, two years payback uh, on return on investment. So there again, when we entered that company, you know, we bought it, it was listed 2014. We, we looked at that company and Uh, never really got comfortable with the price and it had a run up and then towards, uh, uh, when was it? Yeah, 2018, 2019, you know, we had it, 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 some, some depression in the price and we bought into it uh, at a price we deemed um, to be attractive at that stage. But it's, it's, it's a truly phenomenal company that has done very, very well for us. You know, since it listed, it's compounded at more than 35%. So that's since 2014. I actually believe it's going to accelerate 
um, extremely good uh, managers, uh, Zach Listo uh, and his partner being 80% uh, insider owners uh, and operators. Um, best best in industry returns on capital, you know, constantly posting returns on equity in excess of 40%. It's debt free. And what I like about them is, you know, they, 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 they operate in an industry where a few winners will take most. And they already have a leading market share in this industry. But the industry is so that the, the, the market is so large that their market share is still relatively small to, to the total market. And uh, this is exactly the type of companies that we like to invest in, um, where it's technology enabled, uh, where they can scale, where they have a very large market and they can use that technology to grow into that market. This is also a company, you know, where it epitomizes that concept of uh, scale economy shared, uh, where the more data you have, the better your solution, the better your solution, the more customers you get, the more customers you get, the more profitable you get, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and, and you can get some of that benefit through the, through the customers and the flywheel just takes over um, and it grows fast. And, you know, this is a, a company that emanated from South Africa uh, about six years ago. Only 6% of their revenue came from non-South African uh, jurisdictions. Now it's about 30%. And within the next few years, it's going to be 50%. So it's, it's truly a global company operating across five continents and 23 uh, countries um, that's been trading at a South African discount. Uh, what is interesting now, I can talk about it because it is in the public domain, is that uh, they are busy with uh, corporate action and they will be moving their primary listing to the NASDAQ. Again, to your very, very earlier question, why do they do this? Because the shares were underappreciated. Um, and now I guess, you know, NASDAQ is a proper home for um, a based in industry, a smart mobility SaaS company. I think their share price will be uh, appreciated there. Help me understand what have they done technology wise to come from a car tracking company to this software as a service uh, mobility company? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's start, you know, it's a gradual process. It's a very, very gradual process. Um, there's this beautiful concept that I heard from Josh Wolf once where he said, if you ask anyone how they got to where they are now, then in retrospect, they will give you a beautiful linear account of exactly all the events that happened that brought them to where they are. But, you know, a priori, when you are there in the moment, you just don't know. All you, all you do is you are faced with randomness and optionality and you, you take whatever you choose and, and, and what is dictated. And to some extent, you know, that is the benefit of having such um, uh, an agile and intelligent and fan fanatical uh, management team. So if you have stolen vehicle recovery, then you know you can track a vehicle. And what's, what's, what's the next, you know, natural thing to do is instead of just tracking vehicles when they are stolen, maybe we can use it as a fleet solution. So if you have several different vehicles in your fleet and you just want to know where they are at any given point in time, uh, let's track them and let's give you a real-time interface that shows you how they are tracked. And now suddenly that opens the doors to so many other things that you can do because now we can add some hardware to that vehicles and we can say, well, let's look at the fuel efficiency. Um, let's look at the maintenance. And if you have cold storage in the back, let's put in a few monitors and uh, do real-time tracking of uh, the temperatures in the cold storage uh, in, in the trailers that you have there. Let's look at the driving behavior. And then suddenly you can do maintenance schedules. You can add on um, cost accounting software, uh, you can uh, do optimal routing, uh, accident uh, detection, um, you know, it, it just, it, it becomes endless and it becomes more and more sophisticated as they go constantly, they're constantly just layering. And what they did, which truly differentiates them in the sense that they did this faster and better than anyone else is having one 
cloud-based one solution fits all for everyone, doesn't matter how small or how big you are. And you can simply through your subscription, you can elect how much of the solution you want uh, or how little of the solution you want. Uh, but they essentially have one offering with you know elements where you can opt in and opt out and have um, the, the pricing. That sounds quite interesting. And and, and 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 it's a constant. Sorry, Tillman. It's a constant evolution. You know, now they are thinking about um, uh, not thinking. It's it's actually happening. So they have an insurance department. So they are now an insurance aggregator because they have all of these data points, uh, and they can act as that. Uh, another opportunity for them going forward is, um, you know, used vehicles um, market platform. Uh, the, the traditional old method of buying a used vehicle, if you or I want to go out and buy a used vehicle five years ago, is we look in the media, we go in Gumtree or whatever the online site is and we look for it or we go to a secondhand trader and we look at the car uh, and we decide whether we like it or not, we can do an inspection. But the reality is we have no idea how that car has been driven and whether we've been lied about whether that car has really been in an accident or not. If you buy a vehicle that's come through the car track ecosystem, it's been tracked the way it has been driven, the maintenance that has been done on it, whether it's been in action, where it's been driven, every single granular detail of that is in a log. So it brings so much transparency in dealing with cars. Uh, and it's just another example um, of their expansion opportunities. That sounds quite interesting and there are many opportunities and access to many other market. Another topic that also came through Twitter is the access to financial services. Um, yeah. That's an interesting topic if you're thinking about a growing middle class in a country with not that already grown out institutions. Some people ask about Bitcoin. Um, mm. As an access uh, tool for financial services in South Africa, you have Capitec in your portfolio. Yes. Why is this bank interesting for access? Definitely. So spot on the con concept of widening to access. I think that is one of the main thrusts um, of Capitec. You know, Capitec, the banking industry in South Africa used to be dominated by the so-called big four and Capitec realized that there is an opportunity to come in as a late entrant and disrupt the way things have been doing and deliver a better service, a more customized service, widening access to more people who are unbanked or underbanked or maybe are banked but not truly served um, by the competitors and doing that at a very, very affordable price. And you know it's 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 phenomenal if you see the stellar growth of Capitec. It is the fastest growing bank in South Africa. Um, they have the highest customer satisfaction score in South Africa. They have uh, the best digital banking app in South Africa. They have this extreme um, energetic focus on technology on data analytics, employing the best machine learning and AI uh, in utilizing their data. When it comes to uh, uh, customizing products uh, so that the customer gets a very, very quick or instantaneous customized um, solution um, to deal with. And uh, it's, it's still coming from a very low base if we quickly look at the, the banking environment in, in SA, there are about 30 million um, banked people in SA and the total bankable um, population is about 38 million people. So there are still 8 million people who are unbanked or underbanked. Now, Capitec has about 15 million uh, client accounts. So by client accounts, it's already the biggest bank in SA. But many of those accounts are once-offer accounts or secondary accounts or third accounts, people just checking it out. 
if you measure it by primary banking accounts, Capitec has about 4 million out of a total banking population currently of 30 million. So it's relatively low, but that is growing at an exceptional pace. And it's growing because of their service delivery and because of their price point and because of their simplicity. To give you an idea, I have my wallet here. Tillman, here I have the Capitec. I am now Capitec uh, private um, or, or primary bank client. And I have been in the branches recently dealing with them. It's absolutely amazing. You know, everything is biometric. Uh, I didn't have to use a pen and paper to sign it all. It's completely technology driven. Uh, using biometric eye scanning, biometric fingerprinting, and efficient, quick, simple service. And to give you an idea, I don't know what do you pay all in, you know, for your bank account. Do you have any ideas what your monthly bank fees are? Zero, because I'm very price sensitive. <laughs> yeah, but it's truly zero. Depends I mean, on so the credit card. If I pay... If I want to get cash from some ATMs in no, the US or something. But yeah. on your saving or your checks, like checking accounts, so you don't pay any management fees or anything like that? Five euros with one account I will cancel, but that's it. Yeah. Okay. But it's All it's right. it's the German awesome. banking landscape is very competitive in this this area. Which which is great and completely, you know, different from the US environment. So my banking fees uh, are five rand a month, you know, which is like, what is that? It's 40, 40 cents. <laughs> yeah, 50 cents, something like that. Yeah, 35, 40 cents a month. So it's very, very cheap. And um, again, to the question of widening access, Capitec, what they are doing now is acting the role or playing the role as fintech player and as facilitator. So onto their platform with their reach that they have, they have partnered and onboarded people like Easy Equities, which gives um, you know people the ability to become involved in the market with way lower levels of um, introductory capital, way lower uh, trading fees, um, so that gives them access to that. Um, they have partnered with um, people in the home loan space. They're expanding into that. So it's just the, the, the amount of additional services that they can add and people that they can um, partner with to do this um, makes for Capitec to have an extremely, extremely long runway. Uh, currently, they only serve about 6% or they occupy 6% of the total retail market in SA. So there's a lot to go. Um, and, and, and maybe just this one anecdote, you know, about Capitec relative to the other banks, because I do think there's this fallacy where people tend to lump Capitec within the other banks and then they purely do a peer comparison and they say, but Capitec is ridiculously expensive. Why should we buy it? And the reason is Capitec is a completely different animal. Um, you're not comparing apples with apples. Um, and, and, and Capitex growth uh, comes from a much lower base. If you take someone like First Rand, uh, First National Bank, uh, the CEO sometime at the AGM, he said, you know, for us to grow at 20%, Capitec is growing at 20 plus percent per year, uh, the earnings. He said, for us to grow at 20% FNB, we would have to add the whole of Capitex earnings every single year. And that gives you an idea of how low versus how uh, high the base is that they are growing from. That's a quite interesting scenario. Yeah. I think we're coming to the end of our interview and uh, I want to give you, give you the chance to add something here, a point we haven't touched, maybe some fun facts on penguins and Cape Towns um, or whatever you want to add, if you have something to add. So, I think as a final thought, you know, we, uh, Tillman, have been forged by some tough periods now in the SA market over the past three years. And to no extent imaginable, imaginable as a market caught up to what is happening in many of the developed and some of the other emerging markets currently. 
Now, I am not a macro investor, and uh, I am not particularly good at predicting the future. I am extremely interested in creating the future by acting appropriately in the moment. And uh, I do think that uh, there is quite a compelling case to be made that uh, some of this surplus liquidity will find its way into the SA market. And I do think that now might be a very interesting time that we are entering for people who are looking for off the beaten path opportunities um, here. I think we are in for interesting times. That's quite a good word to close uh, our conversation. Thank you very much for taking the time for the interview and uh, giving great insights into South Africa. We might also plan a trip to visit South Africa um, at some point if it's it's safe and allowed again. Uh, so I'm happy to see you at some point. And uh, just want to say thank you very much for your time and thank you much to the audience to listening to this interview. Yeah. Thank you, Tillman. Really enjoyed it. Bye-bye to everyone. <laughs>